Hello and welcome to episode two of North Point Plus. Episode two. Hey, episode we made two. it to two. The podcast is so nice, we got to do it twice. That's right. <laughs> uh, this is our supplemental podcast. We have our uh, gatherings on Sunday mornings where we have our messages, and this just gives us an opportunity, uh, like we said in the past, to just continue diving deeper, uh, to give us opportunities to interact with each other, to interact with you, um, take questions, and just go deeper. So Most, mostly because Mark and I just like to talk to each other. That's really. Why. And you get to be a part of it, so that's good. <laughs> yes, that's, that's pretty much a exclusively why we're doing it. <laughs> uh, but we got some good questions today, Rick. We got some real, some zingers. Oh, you I'm might, ready. Zing you, me. You might get stumped. So I'm just going to dive right in. First one's a quick one. Yep. Um, this is from Dan Ermetlu. Yep. So thanks, Dan. Um, asks, uh, so in your message, you mentioned an author. Yes. Um, that was impactful. Who was that author? The The author's name is Gary Ezzo. Uh, okay. He created, he wrote a book called Baby Wise. Okay. That's a, that's just a great book for um, for when you have a baby uh, mm-hmm. about how to manage, especially that first year. But uh, he and his wife, Anne Marie, wrote a curriculum called Growing Kids God's Way mm. that impacted Deb and I in a really, really positive way in terms of helping us as we raised our six kids. And, and one of the common themes through that whole curriculum is to help teach your kids um, how, uh, how they interact with, other, with others, with honoring others. Mm. And that's dependent upon helping them understand the, uh, ha- having a rational preoccupation with the preciousness of others. That was, <laughs> that's the phrase that's there. And I, I love that phrase because it says that your mind is really spinning about how important God made other people. Mm. And so it allows you to think about how the choices that you make or that your kids make impact somebody who owns the stuff that they're playing with or, some, yeah. um, or, or how their comments impact those other children or adults or whoever it is. Yeah. So good stuff. Yeah. That's great. I'll have to add that to uh, our Amazon wish list. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, this is a question that, that I had. Uh, so we read from uh, the book of Acts. We read a few passages yeah. from Acts. Um, and Acts is just a, a crazy book when you actually get time to sit down and go through verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Um, and one of the things that often promotes, or I I guess a a question that arises when going through the book of Acts is when you see that church first start, everyone sells everything. It says they sell all they own. They were generous with one another. No one was had any need at all. So why today are we not asking everyone at North Point to sell everything they own just like they did in the church of Acts? That's a great question. (laughs) Um, I I think that the answer is that it's... um, that what happened in the first century caused the believers to recognize what they needed to do to help be the body of Christ. Mm. And, and in some cases, they did sell everything that they owned. But at the end of uh, Acts 4, it talks about, um, uh, about uh, Barnabas. Mm. And it says that he sold a piece of property. So he was a part of the church in Acts 2, so they didn't sell everything that they had. He's the one guy um, that didn't yeah. sell everything. <laughs> yeah, um, I, well, Ananias and Sapphira obviously also had property too. Yep. So I think what it, it's probably not a literal um, rendering of everything. Every single person yeah. sold it, every it single thing. It was like they said, man, they sold everything, yeah. which doesn't mean that he sold everything that they had. It just means that they were willing to sacrifice and do whatever was necessary to help take care of each other, to yeah. help uh, express that concern, and to help alleviate those needs. Yeah, so I think the the biblical principle for us, or the application for us, would be, are we a church known for sacrificing to the point where it would seem like, gosh, it seems like they're giving up everything yeah, and, for and, the people and I around think, them. I think it really speaks to our whole concept of, of um, ownership, mm. um, that it's easy for us to say, oh, I bought that car. Oh, mm. I own that house. Oh, I um, that's my cottage or whatever it is, mm. rather than recognizing everything that we have is on loan to us because we're not taking it with us when we die. Mm. And and that God has blessed us with those things, and when we when we see things with that perspective, it's pretty easy to hold things with an open hand and say, "Oh, you know what? Yeah, I have a car that I'm not going to be driving for the next several days, and you have a need. Go go ahead hmm. and do that, or uh, you know whatever it is, being willing to share, even if that 
or maybe especially if that involves sacrifice. Yeah. Um, we tend to be willing to give out of our abundance, yeah. at, to loan out of our abundance. Oh, you know what? I've got three of those things. Yeah, go ahead and take it. I've got mm. two chainsaws. You go ahead and borrow one. Um, rather than thinking, um, no, you have a need for, for chainsaws. Go ahead and take mine. And what that means is that I'm not going to cut down my trees for probably another three weeks, and that's mm -hmm. going to create some inconvenience, but you have a greater need than I do right now. And so I'm willing to, I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to prefer you above myself. Yeah, that's, that's a great way of putting it. Um, this next one, I'm just going to kind of bring up the topic and then let you run with it. Oh, boy. So you brought up um, in your message this concept of diving deep yeah. and swimming wide. So maybe for someone that wasn't paying super close attention during the message, unpack a little of what that means and then unpack more of what that looks like and why that's so important for us. Yeah, let me just say this, because um, we're, we're still figuring out this whole podcast thing. We probably need to do just a, a big overview statement. Obviously, if you're watching, hopefully you, you've you already experienced the message, mm -hmm. but we're talking about the context of the church and um, and and how the church interacts with each other. Um, both universally and, and locally. So, so the whole concept of, of diving deep and swimming wide is that I think that, that what can happen is that we, we um, surround ourselves with people who are like-minded, with other followers of Jesus. We, we put ourselves into disciple-making relationships, and we say, oh, that, that's the thing that really helps me grow. And I dive deep into that. And so I let people in at a deep level. Um, we have conversations about things that really matter and that, that, um, that, that really are core to our relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we dive deep with those people and we say, that's enough. You know what? As long as I have that, as long as I have my life group, I'm good. As long as I have that mentor in my life, I don't need anybody else. And we need to have those relationships. That's, that's that concept of diving deep. When you dive from very high up and you hit the water, you go down a long way. You dive deep. Um, but we also need to swim wide, and we need to, we need to understand that in the body, our, what God is doing in us impacts people besides those people that we dive deep with. And so that we need to, we need to be intentional about reaching out to other people um, and reaching out beyond what our little circle is. So I've, I'm involved in a life group. Um, I love my life group. And we have great, deep conversations in my life group. Those are people I'm doing life with. But I, I circulate at church. I have interactions at church when we gather to worship um, with all kinds of people who are not just a part of my life group. And I, I, I'm spurred on to good deeds by those other people, not just the people in my life group. I, I'm able to encourage other people, and other people are able to encourage me. And so I would say to you, man, if you're involved in a ministry group, in a life group, in disciple-making relationships, whatever those are, though, that's so important. But think beyond that and how God can use you beyond that. And I think even greater than that, we need to think beyond our local church. So I need to be involved in those relationships. I need to swim wide at North Point. But I also need to swim wide beyond North Point. Mm. Um, one of the reasons why why we hosted the Global Leadership Network, uh, the Global Leadership Summit this year, is because we have a responsibility to the kingdom as a whole. And if I only dive deep here, um, we miss being a part of the greater work that God is doing across denominational lines, across um, uh, country uh, lines. And being being able to be a part of that is a, is a really good thing. So dive deep and swim wide. Yeah, that's great. And it, it kind of calls back a little to, I mean, it definitely calls back to the um, the analogy we talked about last week of the actual body of Christ. Right. It would be a weird thing for your hand to say, I can't scratch the itch on my shoulder because, you know, I'm really just close with my forearm. So I'm going to deal yeah. with things in this area and I'll let, you know, I'll let the neck take care of that. Right. Like the body of Christ is meant to swim wide in that sense right. and address the needs of the whole body, not just the localized areas of that yeah. particular need. And and in that in that big in the in the church context, there are things that we can do at North Point um, that that a smaller church in the area can't do. Yeah. There are things that we can do that a larger church in the area can't do. 
And there are things that churches in other parts of the world can't do that we can do. And so we need to, we need to be connected to all mm. of them and just see how God can use us in that yeah. way. Yeah, that's great. Um, so this was a, a, a submitted question. I'm actually, I'm probably going to combine both of these questions. One of them was anonymous. Yep. Um, the second one... Uh, I want to talk to the anonymous one. Okay, yeah, so yeah, we'll, we'll do that one first. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, so there's an anonymous question, and then the second one submitted by uh, Mandy Bayshore. So thank you, Mandy, for yeah. submitting your question. So um, again, in the context of being the church, um, investing and initiating in the church, uh, the first question is, how do you know when you're doing enough? Um, and where is the line of working with slash for the church and not running yourself crazy with all your other life commitments? And then Mandy's question goes hand in hand with that, um, is, is kind of struggling to see where you connect at North Point when your weeks are just filled with work and family and friends and making time for North Point. So you kind of have both ends of, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm doing stuff, but am I doing enough? And then I don't feel like I can do anything because of all of my time commitments. Yeah. I, I, th I there's, uh, I, I want to respond to that in a couple of different directions. Yeah. One is that, um, our, de my desire in this series is not to create a burden or a sense of obligation. Mm -hmm. Um, because if we respond out of a sense of obligation, that will only see us through for a really short period of time. Yep. And until you stop feeling guilty. Yep. And then once you stop feeling guilty, Meh. You, 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 you don't do it anymore. So, so I would use that question really as a springboard to say, this is really all about where your heart is. Hmm. So, and, and as I was thinking about the question when we, when we talked about it a little bit earlier today, um, I was thinking about... Um, what happens in your family? Um, you've got all these obligations at work, and you've got maybe obligations that are in the community, and you've got an obligation to your family. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a matter of where your prior, where the priority of your heart takes you. Mm -hmm. um, if you invest completely in your work and ignore your family, that's not good, and that will wreck your family. Yeah. Um, if you, um, if it may be that there are things that you can do that are part of what you love and find joy to that you can bring your family into that's it's just a natural expression of who right. you are. So when my kids were a lot younger and I was playing softball, um, as a family, we would go do the softball game mm -hmm. together. And that was great fun. I got to play softball. My kids got to watch me play softball. The kids yep. would play on the playground. I'd watch them play on the playground. Deb's talking to the other wives and, and people around. That was it was a, a an event that became a family event because yeah. that was part of what we were doing life uh, how we were doing life. I think the question here is to recognize that as a follower of Jesus and as a member of the body of Christ, a, our heart needs to be with the church. Mm. That doesn't mean that we only do church things or that there's a certain percentage of things that we do that that are connected to the body. What it does mean is that that we're constantly evaluating the things that we do for what's most important in our life. Mm -hmm. So if, if, um, uh, if you're watching, if you listen to me very long, if you talk to me, I, I love racquetball. If I'm playing racquetball so much that, that my relationships with other people in the church stop happening, mm. that's too much racquetball. Yeah. Um, if there's a way that I can bring people who are getting to know Jesus to come with me to play racquetball, win win. Th that's that's <laughs> a huge deal because I still get to exercise. Yeah. We get to have great conversations, and and that becomes just a part of, of how right. we connect to each other. So so I would say to somebody like Mandy that I know has um, huge ministry in her job at school. Her job really is a, a significant part of her ministry. The, the challenge is, how do you bring the church into that context as well? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that she's done is allowed me to have some interaction with her students mm -hmm. on occasion, which is a really, really cool thing. Yeah. It also puts, puts her in a place where um, she can just talk naturally about what, what's happening at church to her students yeah. so that they see that and it, and it becomes an attraction for them. Um, the, uh, but, but there always is really a challenge to say, okay, these 
all of these things that fill my schedule, how important are they? And, and God, help my heart for your body to grow um, because we all, we all make time for the things that are most important for us. Mm-hmm. So if my heart is for the body of Christ, I'm going to say no to some things so I can say yes to the body of Christ. Yeah. Um, and that's I, think, that's, that's, I think, the challenge. It's not a question of, oh, you have to give eight hours a week to, the, you know, to serving in a church somehow or having some kind of relationship like that. Yeah, and I think, I think along with that, recognizing that we all go through seasons of life right. where it looks different. Yes. So like in in my life we just had a baby. So church involvement would look very different. Yeah. <laughs> now than it did 6 months ago, 6 years from now. Right. Um and two a- along with that we can kind of go through seasons and other people in our life go through seasons and we can play the comparison game yep. of, oh, well, they do put in eight hours a week and look at the ministry and the, and the results that they can have. And some of that is good to, to have that conviction of, you know, to really evaluate priorities. And some of it is we can't play the comparison game. Right. Because that's not a healthy way of evaluating what God is putting on my heart. Yeah, that doesn't serve. necessarily measure um, significance. Right. When we compare to what somebody else does, right. so right now Deb and I empty nest. Our our six kids, our seven grandkids aren't at home. Yeah, we have time to be able to do things that we didn't have time to do when we were raising six kids. Yeah, but there were some things that we could do with six kids, in terms of ministry and and ministry within the church that we can't do yep. now as empty nesters because we don't have the same kind of connections that we did right before. Right. Yeah, that's great. Um, let's see, where are we at with questions? Um, so this, this is one that, that, that I thought of um, as you were going through your message. And again, whenever you talk about this, the, the book of Acts, a lot of questions come up. And a, a, a fairly common critique slash question of the church, especially in America, is, well, it just, it just looks like a business model. You know, the church is it's set up where it has this hierarchy and it just looks like it's run like a business. So what do you think about that criticism? And if, if there's validity to it, is that a bad thing for the church to look that way? That, that's a great question. And um, I would probably uh, transfer your question and, and, and not use the word business, but an organization. Yeah. Because um, it, it clearly is an organization. Yep. And the way that I would respond would be, before I get to the end, to the, <laughs> to the full answer, I yeah. would say God created people. Yep. God created in people the need for communication, mm-hmm. the need for structure, the need for systems, yep. all of those things. So whenever you get people together, there begins to be some sense of order because God designed that into us. There was order when he created the world. Yeah. Um, and so the organizational principles that apply that help an organization be effective because God also created in us um, the need and desire to accomplish things that matter. Mm -hmm. And when we do that with other people, that's an organization trying to accomplish those things. So, So God created all that, which means the best organizational practices that help an organization fulfill its purpose those are God given. Hmm. Those are those are not from Satan. Yeah, Satan is not who helps organizations be effective. Satan takes no. and twists and all like all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but those are principles that come from God, from from His nature, and so it makes sense that as an organization, we're trying to fulfill our mission to help all people move towards a life fully devoted to Jesus. Yeah, if we can create systems and structures to do that more effectively, we're going to do that. The challenge for all of us, whether it's in the church or in business or whatever, is to not ever to let those organizational principles calcify and become a burden that, that limits our ability to fulfill our purpose mm-hmm. rather than enhancing our ability to fulfill that purpose. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then this uh, is a question that came up for me again as you were speaking there's this there's this constant wrestling intention it seems like in the church at large who is the church for it seems like we want to have a black and white answer like the church is for believers people that follow Jesus and then you have people maybe in another camp that say no the church is for outreach for those that don't know Jesus do you have an opinion on who Rick who's the church for yes <laughs> yeah. um the 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 um 
I don't know if I still have that. And uh, no, the the I went back and looked because last week in our podcast I I um, alluded to a quote that uh, has impacted me a lot. That the that the churches the church is the only um, organization mm. whose um, whose purpose is uh, for those outside of the organization. Yep. The church exists to help us. Um, come to know and follow and love Jesus fully and to help us introduce people who don't know Jesus yeah. to know and love and, and, and follow him completely as well. So the, the benefit of the, of the church is for the people who don't know him. Yeah. Um, so if we're effective as a church, it's got to impact the community. It, it has to have ripples that go far beyond what happens inside the building itself. And um, if we're effective as, as a church, God's going to be lifted up and people are going to see how good he is and how much he loves them. And so um, uh, if we're effective as a church, people who come and are drawn to him are, are going to say, I want to experience that. Yeah. And so it is it, uh, clearly it's for uh, people who are fully devoted followers of Jesus, for disciples, mm-hmm. and it's for people who don't yet know Jesus both. Yeah. Well, it's not as controversial an answer as <laughs> some were hoping for, but it does bring good clarity. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this last this last question um, is kind of a two-parter. Um, you, toward the end of your message, brought up this concept of be more than comfortable. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I love the phrasing of that because as I was thinking through what you were, t- what you were kind of bringing out... Um, we think of the church, and the church is a place of comfort, um, right. and the presence of God, bringing you know, bringing brought into a right relationship with God, is a very comforting thing. Um, and yet, so often in Scripture, you see time and again the church put in very uncomfortable right. situations. Um, and so you kind of have this. It's not even attention because it's what's supposed to happen. Is you're brought into comfort and you expand beyond that comfort to kind of bring that comfort with you um, and to bring the comfort of God into whatever that might be. Um, and so I don't know if you want to unpack that or uh, Kate, uh, Kate Dolphy submitted a great question um, that kind of brings in the practical application. So is there any response or, or um, a branch off that you want to have off of, of what I'm bringing up or do you want to jump to Kate's question? Well, uh, let me let me just talk for a second and then we'll see if, if we uh, if we hit where, where Kate was asking. The... Yeah. Um, when I was working on the message and I was thinking about that, my initial the, the initial thing that I wrote to myself was um, that we I need to challenge people to be uncomfortable, hmm. um, and that's true. But but I think the phrase "more than comfortable" is even more true mm-hmm. because because there is a sense in which in the church you find a sense of comfort. Yeah. Um, but. The ch- but comfort is all about me. It really is very yeah. selfish. Um, what's comfortable for me, if I say, oh, I want to I be comfortable, that may not be comfortable for you. Right, um, right. So it, it's very me-focused. I, I, I want to recognize that Jesus sent a comforter mm. to us in the Holy Spirit. And so he does comfort us in our affliction. Yeah. Um, but... He calls us to not just live in our comfort, but to go beyond that. And so that's that whole concept of, of more than comfortable. Um, I've I prayed a prayer, uh, heard this turn of words a long time ago, but it's been my prayer often that God would comfort the afflicted and that he would afflict the comfortable, hmm. um, particularly in the church. Yeah. That it's, if, we're, if we're coming in and we're just doing, oh, yeah, that feels good, that's not a good place to be, hmm. and if we're coming in and our and, and things are a mess, we're experiencing all kinds of uh, affliction, um, tension, um, stress. Yeah, that the Holy Spirit would come in and just alleviate that in a way that only He can. Yeah. So and and, and we had talked uh, earlier about this concept of you know there's there's things that we do that make us uncomfortable in the moment that are designed to bring comfort as the end result of what we're doing. Right. Um, so you had brought up like 
planning for retirement. Yeah. Oh, is yeah, a, yeah. Is an uncomfortable thing. Like no one likes to sit down, sit down with the books, go through finances, and go through like the headache-inducing process of financial planning and retirement planning. But man, that brings a lot of comfort later on once that's done. Right. Anything, anything that is worth experiencing, is you're going to be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So. Having kids, you know this now. <laughs> Having a baby, yeah. that's pretty uncomfortable and pretty inconvenient. Yeah. Um, buying a house, that's pretty uncomfortable and in- inconvenient in terms of going through the move and all those kinds of things. Planning for retirement. Um, getting a new job, mm. moving into a new position with new responsibility, that's uncomfortable and inconvenient. Anything that's worth um, experiencing is going to make us uncomfortable and inconvenient. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, our natural our natural bent is to move towards comfort. Yep. And we have to recognize that in the church, um, in the body of Christ, that we're called to be more than comfortable. And that means that I'm going to sacrifice some of my comfort for the benefit of the body. Because yeah. I care about you, I'm willing to be to inconvenience myself so that you can grow. Hmm. Um, the the if I, if I can just share a a personal illustration um, from this past week. We have we have friends that um, they had a problem with their vehicle. Um, Deb and I have two vehicles. Rarely are both vehicles on the road at the same time. Yeah. And I, and so I just said, hey, if you need a vehicle in the interim, um, uh, why don't you why don't you borrow one of ours? And and they said to us, you know, that would be a, an incredible help. Uh, we were glad to be able to do that, and frankly, it was inconvenient because there are times that we had to reorganize our schedule and right. redo things because we were working with one vehicle. The sacrifice that it took to do that, it really was minimal. It was inconvenient, but it was yeah. minimal, and and frankly, we were glad to be able to do that because it was able to bless somebody else, and it was able it, it enabled them to see God working. Mm. through the body yeah. in a very tangible way. Yeah. Well, it just, um, it, all of it obviously goes back and connects to Jesus. But it, yeah. imagine Jesus having the mindset of, I don't like... Going to the I, cross was not very comfortable. Yeah, if I don't want to be yeah. comfortable, I don't want to do that. And yeah. I mean, part of it is he felt that way. <laughs> right. And still made the choice to lay down his life and be right. quite uncomfortable for a very yeah. comforting result. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, for Kate's question, uh, Kate, this is a great way to end it because it's very practical. I like practical application. Yeah. So, um, Kate asks, in the sermon it was stated to be more than comfortable, what are ways that that can be done? What are what are tangible examples of, of what we can do to be more than comfortable? I'm going to tease that answer <laughs> and say, come on Sunday for next week's message because we're going we're gonna to talk specifically uh, about a whole lot of practical things. Great. But, but l- let me just give you one. Um, it's um, comfortable to come worship at 9.30 and leave at 10.45. Mm. It's uncom- It's more than comfortable, <laughs> uncomfortable, <laughs> inconvenient, whatever, yeah. to say, I'm going to worship from 9.30 to 10.45, but I'm going to serve in children's ministry from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, it's it's going to be uncomfortable, more than comfortable for me to get my kids up earlier and to have them there for a longer period of time to be able to, to do both services together. Yeah. It's um, a, another, uh, but that's being more than comfortable, yeah. but recognizing that in that context, it impacts the body in a huge way. Yeah. Um, it, uh, second illustration, <laughs> it's, um, it is more than comfortable um, to have a life group in your home, mm. to, you know, to have six, eight, 10, 12 people that come into your home every week. Yep. For a lot of people, that's just inconvenient. Yeah. But if you can provide the right context for people to learn to know and love Jesus and to, and to have a group of people that can help them grow deep, man, that's so worth it. That's that's being more than comfortable. Yeah, I love it. 
Um, that's a uh, that's but come all Sunday because I got a whole list of things. <laughs> Great. That's all the or questions I have. Or, or live stream. We can live stream as yeah. well. We'll do that. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Rick, is there anything on your end that you want to dive deeper into, or have we have we covered the depths? We uh, I'm sure we haven't covered the depths, <laughs> but uh, I'm looking forward to this Sunday. I think we're gonna um, conclude the series this this week, yeah. and with some real practical things about okay, what's it really look like? to be a part of the body of Christ at North Point in particular. We've talked about the church church universal bi- the biblical basis for what that lo- what the church needs to look like, um, how important it is to be connected to each other, to be yeah. invested. Um, we're going to we're going to dive deep into the practical nature of that this week. Great. Can't wait. Yeah, sounds awesome. good. Awesome. Well, thanks Rick for your time. Thank you guys for submitting your questions. Hopefully this has been beneficial and we will uh we'll see you guys next week. See ya.